Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk. Our talk will be starting shortly. For those of you who are already here, thank you for waiting patiently. While waiting, we would like to share a video with you from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on the bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Understanding Real Property Game Tax. My name is Aaron Liu. I am an associate with Mao Yingguan Associate, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, let me introduce the firm and what we do. Mao Yingguan Associate is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Dr. Mao Yingguan. Our ABLE team today comprises of 26 lawyers and 19 support staff. Dr. Ma is today a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small and medium enterprises, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment and industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our law firm also has various practice groups indicating some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution team. This includes con construction, real estate, foreign direct investment, sports and esports, and also the ASEAN China Desk. Today's talk is part of our MWK online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. Since the implementation of MCO due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have moved our talks online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house counsel. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute any legal advice. In the event that you require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for a complimentary legal consultation. The details will be given at the end of this talk. Now, as you can see on the screen, is the highlight of today. There are two speakers for today's online talk who are Ms. Marilyn Tay and Ms. Azila Amiruddin. Allow me to introduce Marilyn. Marilyn is a senior associate in our firm's conveyancing department. She holds a Bachelor of Law from Multimedia University and a Master of Commercial Law in University Malaya. Her area of practice includes acquisitions and disposals of real estate, property by individual or corporate, loan documentations for various financiers, and drafting various kinds of contracts. Our next speaker, Ms. Azila, is a paralegal in our commencing department. She completed her Bachelor of Legal of Law from University of 
Technology Mara and is currently pursuing her CLT. Her areas of practice include acquisitions and disposals of real property by individual or corporate, loan documentation for various financiers and drafting various kinds of contracts. We will also be having a Q&A session at the end of the talk, so please, if you have any questions, please post them into the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. For today's top points, they are what is RPGT, applying for RPGT exemption, reducing RPGT with allowable loss, RPGT from development, joint ventures, and RPGT and the real property company. Now, without further ado, let us welcome our first speaker of the day, Azila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron, for the introduction and afternoon to everyone. I hope that you all are doing just fine today and excited about the topic that we are going to talk on today. Today, we are going to talk about real property gain tax or more commonly known as RPGT. I will be covering for the first two points and my colleague Marilyn will be take, taking over on the last uh, three top points. Let's start with what is RPGT is all about. I believe most of you know and aware about the individual personal income tax where it is a tax imposed on individual or entities in respect of the income and profit earned by them. The RPGT is a tax that is levied by the Lembaga Hasil Dalam Negeri on the chargeable gains that has been derived from the disposal of the real property or share in a real property companies. The RPGT is governed by the Real Property Gain Tax Act in 1976. First of all, what does it mean by the disposal of real property? Disposal is generally triggered upon a transfership from one person to another, whether by way of sales, conveyance, settlement, alienation, and etc. The definition of real property and a chargeable gain is covered under Section 2 of the Real Property Gain Tax Act. The, re the real property defined in this section as a land situated and interest of option or other right in or over such land. For example, land, houses such as bungalow, apartment, and condominium. The basic of taxation for RPGT is a chargeable gain. Is when the price exceeds the equivalent price. This is defined under Section 7 of the RPGT Act. So now, how do we determine whether there is a gain or not on the disposal of the real property? For example, if you purchase a property at the price of 3000 and after some time, it could be years, you want to sell the property, and this is what we call a disposal of real property. So this is the difference between the disposal price and the acquisition price about 200,000 is chargeable gain made. Let's move on to the next slide. Now, who is the chargeable person? A chargeable person is a person chargeable with tax as defined in Section 2 of the RPGT Act. The Act further elaborates under Section 6, Subsection 1 that every person, whether it is resident or not, in Malaysia, shall be chargeable with RPGT in respect of the gain arising from disposal of a real property. This is including shares in real property companies. Here, based on Section 2 of the RPGT Act, person is not only applies to an individual, but to also include a company, partnership, and a corporation sold. Now that we have determined the three elements of imposition of RPGT, where there must be a chargeable person, and that there must be a chargeable asset, which is the real property, and there must be a chargeable gain. Now, let's look at the date of the disposal. In general situation, a disposal of real property will have a look at the date of disposal of the real property. It is to be deemed to take place when there is a written agreement for the disposal of the real property which means it is on the date of the written agreement. For example, it's on the date of the sale and purchase agreement. However, 
if there is in the situation when there is no written agreement, the date of the disposal shall be the date of the completion of the disposal. It means that the date in which the ownership transferred to by the disposal or on the date which the whole consideration has been received by the disposal. This is covered under paragraph 15 of the second schedule of the RPGT Act. However, there is an exception to the general rule above, which provides that under section 16 of second schedule of RPGT Act, under the conditional act contract, under determine the date, the date of the disposal, it requires approval by the government. The date of the disposal is the date of the approval obtained. It means that if the agreement is subject to any condition or any approval by any authorities, the date of the disposal is the date when such condition or approval is satisfied. For example, the date of the consent to transfer have been obtained by the state authority will be the date of the disposal. Let's move on to this, another slide on the rate of the RPGT Act. This is the latest RPGT rate that can be imposed on the person who is disposing of their real properties. The rate of the tax is different according to chargeable person status. As you can see in the slides here, there are three categories which are the citizen or the permanent res residence, the non-citizen, the foreigner, and the companies. This is provided under Section 4, Subsection 1 of the RPGT, which provides that the tax rate will be charged to each category disposal appropriately specified in Schedule 5 of the RPGT Act. Let me brief you on a little bit of the history of the RPGT rates. RPGT was suspended temporarily in 2007 until 2009 and eventually it was reimposed back in 2010. The individual owner who sold the property that year had to pay a flat rate of 5% if the sale occurred on the first to five years of the date from the purchase and were exempted from paying any tax if the disposal happened thereafter. But since 2014, the RPGT rates for the property sales made within the first to third year were hiked to 30%. For sales made within the fourth year to fifth year, the levy was raised to 20% and to 50% respectively. Disposal of real property made after fifth year were exempted from the RPGT. However, in 2019, the RPGT was again taxed at a flat rate of 5% in the sixth year onward of the property sales and finally, under the budget 2022, it was announced by the government that will no longer impose RPGT for disposal of property by individuals comprising Malaysia citizen, permanent resident and foreigners starting from the sixth year. However, this, that one is remain for the companies. Now, the next slide, we will have to look at the how the RPGT is calculated. The calculating of the RPGT is a fairly a simple process. To know the taxable amount, first we need to know how to calculate the chargeable gain, which is it is a difference between the sales price and the acquisition price. RPGT will then be calculated by multiplying your chargeable gain with the relevant RPGT rates. As you can see from the example in the slides here, a is a Malaysian citizen brought a property in 2020 at the price of 1 million and A is selling off the property at the price of 1.5 million two years later. Here, the chargeable gain is the difference between the sale price and the position, which means it is the 1.5 million minus the 1 million. Hence, the chargeable gain is imposed will be on the 30% rate because A has been disposing the property on the second year after A is acquired the property. So the tax imposed on A will be from 500,000 ringgit, a chargeable gain, at the rate of 30%, which will be 150,000. 
Moving forward, similarly to individual income tax, there are also a tax relief for RPGT. This is covered under paragraph 6, subsection 1, second schedule of the RPGT Act, which is under the incidental loss. Incidental loss is related to the acquisition process, such as listed in the slides here. For instance, the fees commission paid for the professional service of a lawyer who prepared the sale and purchase agreement, the value of fees, the stamp duty amount, cost in advertising to find a seller or buyer, and cost reasonably incurred in making valuation for selling off the property. Looking back at the previous example where A is selling off the property, to calculate the chargeable gain here, we minus the disposal price and the sale price, and also we minus the incidental cost that incurred. Let's say A is incurred an incidental cost of 100,000 for the professional legal fees and the disbursement. So, when A disposing of the property, the chargeable gain calculated here is for 1.5 million minus with 1 million and minus with 100,000 for the chargeable for the incidental loss. So, thus, the chargeable gain now is at 400,000. The second top point today is applying for the RPGT exemption. RPGT Act has several exemptions and among the provisions are for this first-time home seller. Malaysia citizen and permanent resident are granted a once-in-a-lifetime RPGT exemption for the first disposal of their residential under the law. However, the property must have been used for own dwelling and not rented out and used for the investment. This is provided under the Section 8 and this is to be read together with Section 3 of the RPGT Act. Another exemption is provided under Paragraph 3 of the Second Schedule of the RPGT. The RPGT exemption is also available for individual, for example, in the devolution of the disease as disposal of the, prior, of the property shall be deemed to be equal to the acquisition price on the dissolution of the disease property to his executor or legatees. Thus, there is no RPGT as there is no gains accrued from the dissolution of the pro disease property. Apart from the disease asset, there are a list of the transaction of what you can see in the slides that can be exempted from the RPGT. Moving on to the next slide, the disposal also can apply for the exemption if the property disposed by way of gift. Similar to the MOT transfer love and affection, RPGT has an exemption for property transferred within the family between the husband and wife, parents and child, or grandparents and grandchildren. However, the transfer of property between siblings is excluded from this exemption. This privilege provides a 100% exemption on the chargeable gain and is only limited to a Malaysian citizen and permanent resident. It means that the donor shall be have to receive no gain and suffer no loss on the disposal. This is provided under paragraph 12 of the second schedule of the RPGT Act. Lastly, the exemption that have been provided under the RPGT Act is the government has introduced a new RPGT exemption which is effective on the 1st January 2019. This is to help the low income family. The government has fully exempted the sales of affordable house price below the price of 200,000, provided that the person have held the property over the five years, and this RPGT exemption is only applies to the Malaysian citizen. Now, I think, that is all on my part, and I pass the floor to Marilyn to continue the talk. Okay, good afternoon all. Thank you for attending to our talk today. I hope my colleague Azila's sharing just now was an insightful one. Moving forward, we will be visiting the topics of applying RPGT with allowable loss, RPGT from joint venture with developer, and also RPGT and real property company. So, have you ever disposed of a property and the disposal was actually made at loss? 
Speaking from experience, many of the owners are not aware of how to apply those losses that they have suffered from the disposal to cover the gain that they have made from the sale when they are being taxed by LHG and later on. So under Section 7, Subsection 2 of RPGT Act, it has defined allowable loss as any loss that has been suffered on the disposal of a chargeable asset of which if it has been a gain, it will be chargeable with tax. And Section 7, Subsection 4 of the RPGT Act has then mentioned that when there is more than one transaction of real property in a year of assessment, the allowable loss from one transaction may be used to set off against another transaction that yields a chargeable gain. So look, this is, an inter this is the interesting part of RPGT, which means if you have disposed of a property earlier and the disposal at a point of time, the disposal was a disposal at loss you are actually allowed to utilize the loss that you have suffered earlier to cover the gain that you may have made from your future disposal. For example, if you have sold off a property in year 2018 and the disposal was actually a disposal at loss, and from the disposal, you have suffered, say, a loss of 100000 So now, if you want to sell off your property and you have made a gain from the current sale and it's taxable by LHGN, you can actually apply those the losses of 100,000 that you have suffered earlier to set off your current gain. Say if your current gain is around 50,000, not much, but of course, since it's taxable, you still have to save up a little, right? So you can actually utilize the 100,000 gain that you have made earlier to deduct off the 50,000 now and treat it as a no gain from your current sale and no tax is payable. Then now you will be wondering, then what happens to the balance 50,000 loss? Pursuant to Section 7, Subsection 4B of the RPGT Act, any unabsorbed losses that may be carried forward to the subsequent years of assessment until it is fully absorbed. In other words, you can still use the balance 50,000, the unutilized loss of 50,000 to deduct off any gains that you might make and might be taxable later on in the near future. I hope this slide is clear. Okay, so moving forward, we will go over to RPGT from joint venture with developer. So, if you own a piece of land and the developer has approached you to have a joint venture with you to develop your land on your behalf. So here's what you need to know. The date of disposal of the land will be the date of the joint venture agreement that you have signed with the developer and the disposal price that LHDN will take into consideration when calculating your RPGT will be the market value of the land on the date of disposal, i.e. the date of the JV agreement that you have entered with the developer. In return from the joint venture, say the developer has agreed to give you some of the units as a contract of your land, the date of acquisition of the units will then be the date of the JV agreement that you have entered with the developer. The acquisition price, on the other hand, will be calculated based on the selling price of the unit fixed by the developer divided by the total selling price of all the units that you have received from the developer plus together with any cash consideration received over the units, if any, multiplied by the market value of the land on the date of the joint venture agreement. For example, if you have bought a property a land, say a piece of land, three years, say in 2019, okay? And the price that you have paid for the land is at the price of 1.3 million. A developer has approached you a year later and you have agreed to transfer the land to the developer for them to develop. And in return, the developer has promised to give you 10 units of the houses developed by the developer later on. So currently, the development has completed and each of the houses are valued at the price of 450,000. The current market value of the land, say 4 million right now, from this, the calculation of RPGT at this stage will be 4 million deducting the 1.3 million of your acquisition price earlier. And the amount of profit that LHDN takes into consideration will then be 2.7 million. But at this stage, the developer does not need to pay any retention sum to, the, to LHDN as there is no consideration payable to you. However, if the developer has agreed to pay you some sum of money as consideration to secure the deal, 
then retention sum of 3% is payable to LHDN and the forms and tax will then have to be paid based on that. Flowing from the example above, after the completion of the development, you have decided to sell off one of your units that you have received from the developer at the price of 600,000. In this scenario, the acquisition price of the unit will be calculated as 450,000, which is the disposal price fixed by the developer, divided by the total price of the units that you have received from the developer, which is 4.5 million, multiplied by the current market value of the land of 4 million, and that then comes up to 400,000, which is taxable by the government. The RPGT payable will then be 600,000 minus of the acquisition price of 400,000, of which your taxable profit will then be 200,000. I'm sorry, guys. Just let me set up my video for a while because I think there is some hiccups. I hope you guys can see me clearer now. I'm so sorry for the green screen effect. Okay, so moving forward, I hope the joint venture with developer is clear enough. If you do have any questions, do drop by to us later on and we, will, we are more than happy to address to your questions later. Moving forward, we will go to the part of RPGT and Real Property Company. So... What is RPC and how is RPGT imposed in the scenario of RPC? So RPC can be defined as a controlled company that owns property or RPC shares in other RPC companies or both, and the value of the real property or shares in the other RPC or both is not lesser than 75% of the value of the total tangible assets of the company. A controlled company under the Income Tax Act can be defined as any company that has lesser than 50 members and it's being controlled by not more than five persons. Pursuant to paragraph 34A sub 6 of Schedule 2 of the RPGT Act, once a share turns into a turns into RPC share, it will always remain as an RPC share, regardless of whether if the company later on ceases to be an RPC company or not. So what is the total tangible? It is actually the aggregated of the defined value of the real property and shares in the RPC and the value of any other tangible assets owned by the company. It can be either in the form of cash, debtors, fixed assets, stocks, and or any prepayments. In calculating the total tangible asset of the company, the current liabilities of the company would be excluded from the calculation. So many will then ask, properties such as intellectual property that is being owned by a company, is it taken into calculation? Based on LHGN's guideline, intellectual properties are intangible properties, and hence, they are not taken into consideration in determining the total tangible asset of the company. Next, on the cessation of RPC, can a RPC company turns to be a non-RPC company later on? The answer is actually yes. Once a control company is determined to be RPC on a given date, it will remain as a RPC and there is no necessity for us to re-examine its RPC status. Thereafter, unless if the RPC company ceases to be a control company or when they dispose of a real property all RPC shares that is being owned by the company, and that turns the real property of the company to be lesser than 75% of the total tangible set of the RPC. However, in this situation, it is only the status of the company that has turned to be from RPC to non-RPC. The shares of the company that are RPC will still remain as RPC shares and hence taxable in its transaction. Lastly, we will look into the, of the RPC shares. If a company was already in existence before 21st of October 1988, that's the date that RPC came into picture from LHDN, and on 21st of October 1988, the company has been determined to be an RPC. The shareholders of the company are deemed to have acquired the shares, the RPC shares, on the 21st of October 1988 itself. Hence, from this, we can see that even if the shares are acquired at the time when the company is not an RPC company, the shares are still deemed to have been acquired on the date when the company subsequently becomes an RPC. 
So that's the end of our sharing. I will then return the floor to our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Azila and Marilyn for sharing. Now, let's, let us move to Q and our Q&A session. And all the participants, if you have any questions unclear or not sure about how RPGT works or what is RPGT, feel free to input your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and our speaker will answer accordingly. So our first question that we have received is from Sydney Wong. Her question is, is the blanket consent considered consent approval and file within 60 days once approved or otherwise? Can I take on this question? Yes, please. Sydney, because basically when we have, when you mentioned about blanket consent, so usually which means you have purchased the property from a developer and right now the strata title has been issued and you have to perfect the transfer based on the blanket consent. So of course, as we all, the general practice is that if you are purchasing a property from the developer, you do not have to file in your RPGT forms to the Indian Revenue Board. Unless if you were to mention about you're purchasing a property from another individual and consent is applicable and you have to apply for consent, then the 60 days for you to file in your returns of form will be from the date of your obtainment of the consent approval from the land authority. By looking at blanket consent that you have meant over here, if you are talking about developer sale, then you don't have to file in your RPGT returns. But if you are mentioning about sub-sale later on, in terms of consent for sub-sales, then yes, 60 days is from the date of your consent approval. I hope I've answered your questions. And moving forward, Eric. Thank you, Marilyn. Our next question is from Catherine Lee. Disposal gain equals the disposal price less acquisition price. Does it allow for net disposal price as in disposal price, less legal fees, real asset agent fees, commission, or other costs associated with the property's disposal? Okay, I think I can answer on this question, Erin. Okay, for disposal gain, when the disposal price is lower than the acquisition price, the RPGT is not applicable on this situation as the disposal price of the property is equal or lower on the, than the acquisition price. The RPGT is chargeable. It's only there if there is a profit gain from the disposal of your property. I hope that answer your question. <laughs> I think to ask the last point, I'm sorry, Erin. Catherine, if your question is, if you are trying to say that if disposable gain is equivalent, as in it's by definition, the disposal price less than the acquisition price of the property. And if there has been a gain, yes, your gain, you can actually take it to deduct off all the costs that you have actually spent on the property, like what you have mentioned, legal fees, renovation fees, agent commissions, and things what's not. And if, for example, your disposal, the price after deducting all this allowable re reduction on your price, then if it's lesser than your acquisition price, then yes, we deem that as a loss. And you don't have to file in tax. As in, you still have to file in tax, but you don't have to pay tax for it. I hope I've answered your question. Moving forward. Thank you, Alina and Marilyn. Our next question from Helen. How many years applicable on property loss against gain? I think that's my part. Okay, Helen. Before this, last time when they first introduced allowable loss, government has actually in the act itself mentioned that it's only for one tax, one taxation year, tax assessment year. But later on, they have revised it to five years. But right now, the current rule is that there is no years for you to, there's no restriction on years. So you can apply it until it's fully absorbed. So of course, which means our advice to you will be then, if you do have even right now that you do not have to file in, as in you do not have to pay tax after five years, in the event if it's a loss of your on the it's a loss that you have suffered, just make sure that your lawyers file in all these proof and evidences for the loss and claim it as a loss, even though you don't have to pay tax after five years for individuals. Yeah. So that you can actually utilize that for any future gains that you might make from the sale in future. Thanks, Marilyn. Our next question is in the chat box. It's from Huang Yan Ti. Is there RPGT implication on landowner in a JV transaction with developer for development of land? Yes, of course. As a landowner, if you do have a joint venture with developer for developer to 
uh, develop your land, RPGT will definitely be in picture because you are currently making a gain from your property, even though there is no clear-cut gain from it. So what I've mentioned in my slides, in the event, say, if you have, unless if you sell off the property to a developer and the developer, the clear-cut situation will be you selling off the property to a developer at a net consideration and the developer developed the land and the land is no longer your problem. So in that situation, RPGT is definitely in picture for it. But if we are talking about JV with developer, then we have to look into several aspects of it on whether if you do receive any cash from the developer or it's purely contra. So if it's by cash, then at the point of time when you receive cash from the developer, then that particular cash, you have to declare it to the government and then after that pay tax for it and you have to file and pay retention sum for that sum. But in the event, if you were, we are talking about contra units, then the calculation that I have explained just now on the current disposal price minusing of the price that has been fixed by the developer and things what's not multiplied by the current market value, that is the calculation that they will use as a tax. And yes, RPGT is taxable in that scenario. Thanks, Marilyn. Our next question is from Catherine. If the landowner consents for the land to be developed into apartment for rent and has agreed to 25% equity for the landowner, if the landowner decides to accept rentals instead of disposal of property, is RPGT still applicable? Hi, Catherine. Okay, that will depend mainly on what's the agreement that you have with the developer. Like your question, you have mentioned that the landowner is JVing with the developer for the developer to develop apartment on your rent on your land for rent and the developer has agreed to give you 25% equity for the land eh, for the units right so for that share you are mentioning that will RPGT still applicable if you accept rentals instead of disposal of property in that sense we believe that you definitely will have an agreement with the developer on how much rental it is that you have fixed for your unit and RPGT will still be taxable based on the price of the, each of every unit as per the market value at that point of time. Thank you, Marilyn. We are accepting the last two questions. So the next question, if the property was inherited and no acquisition price, how to calculate the RPGT? I think I can answer this question. Okay, if the property was inherited, this one, the inherited property is not taxable because currently in Malaysia, no inheritance has been imposed. Meaning to say that the acquiring of the property is, there is no gain and no loss. There is no taxable on the real property. Thank you. Marilyn, I think these two questions are uh, continue off the previous question from Catherine. In other words, there is still RPGT in the absence of actual physical disposal. Yes, Catherine, we will still have to calculate it in, but of course, do bear in mind participants because on taxation-wise, we can only advise this far on actual how LHDN is going to take in, what are they going to take into consideration and how they're going to tax you. It's based on the particular officer that assessed your situation. We can't really advise you further, but we have to have, we can only help you to file in and at which the end, when they take, when they take over your file, they will come up with their tax assessment. And of course, they will come up with the explanation of how they tax you and things what's not and how they actually calculate out tax. Then only we will be able to explain to you how they actually did it and how they came up the derivation of the calculation and things what's not. So we can't really tell you how are they going to tax it until later on when this particular scenario happens. And when we file in tax, LHDN comes up with the explanation, then we will be able to further elaborate and explain it to you in that situation. Yeah. So of course, yes, RPGT is still taxable. Anyway, even if RPGT is not taxable, they will come in via way of income tax. It runs hand in hand for both RPGT and income tax, actually. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, Marilyn. Next question by Su Shenke. What is the consequence if both transferor and transferee, transfer by way of love and affection or as a gift, fail to file RPGT form within the prescribed period? Okay, from the talk just now, if the transfer is by way of gift, then the RPGT will be exempted from the tax. But there is still a 
certain period of time that you are excluded from the tax and you need to file it still within the prescribed period. And if you have filed in with, uh, after the certain prescribed period, usually there will be a penalty that will be imposed by the inland revenue when they access and they forward to you the assessment notice. But this is not applicable on the transfer by date of gift or love and affection. And okay, in the event on in terms of filing of if you fail to file in your RPGT forms to LHDN within the prescribed time, or you fail to make any payment to LHDN within the prescribed time, and in your scenario, if it's it's via love and affection. Even though when there is no consideration, they can't impose you penalty, but they can still come in way of criminal and summon you to court to tell you that you have failed to file. And then after that, get you to pay penalty for late filing. Yeah. Thank you. Can we take one last question from Helen? Helen's question is, the RPC losses of disposal of property, can it take losses by individual shareholders? Okay, Helen. On this one, you meant by RPC in the event if a real property company has suffered some losses due to the disposal of the property, can this loss be taken into consideration as a calculation of tax of RPGT on individual shareholders, is it? If that is the case, yes, you can still deduct it off as in when the company has actually suffered loss, but via the financial statement, you can still take into consideration of those losses suffered. Of course, LHDN has got their calculation on that. And we will advise you further if in the event, if you require our service to help you to see whether if, how are they applicable and things, what's not on a personal basis. We have got free consultation anyway. Thanks, Marilyn. And thank you everyone for all for your questions to our speakers. And we hereby end the Q&A session. Thank you, Azila and Marilyn for your wonderful insights and sharing session. Before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. First, please join us again for our upcoming talk. Our next talk is on the 22nd of February, 2023, on a topic that most of us may come across, the 101 friendly loans. Our speaker for this topic will be Hannah Patrick and Jeremy Balang. You can also scan the QR code on the screen to sign up for our online talk. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link of the form will be posted in the chat shortly. Thirdly, do follow or like all our social media accounts. We are on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and also Facebook. Lastly, if you would like to speak with any of our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the phone or over video conference, such as Google Meet or Zoom. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is posted in the chat box or you may scan the QR code on the screen. To our guests, thank you for joining us. We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. Thank you, everybody, and see you at our next talk.